So friends, colleagues, this is a very special week. It's a special week because we, we have something to celebrate. But it's also a special week because yesterday the Quantum Manifesto was launched. Perhaps you're not aware of it. If you've read some of the news articles, you may have seen it. It was yesterday. Uh, Physics World uh, profiled it like this. Quantum Manifesto for Europe calls for one billion in funding. This is a um, EU flagship. As you know, there are two EU flagships running at this moment. Flagship is some technical term for a major investment into science, which has technological impact, is expected to have technological impact in Europe. The two flagships are, anyone? Graphene and human brain. These are the two flagships each 1 billion 10-year projects. And yesterday, this manifesto calls for the, the, this manifesto which was launched yesterday calls for the third flagship in quantum technology. And it's very much uh, something to be proud of because it's a Dutch, it's a Dutch effort. It's the, uh, perhaps the most l lasting legacy of the chair, as you know, the, the Netherlands is chair of the EU just for one more month or two more months. And who knows, perhaps the, their solution of the refugee crisis will be the most lasting legacy, but things are not looking very good for that at this moment. And, and uh, this is the other big project. And you see here in this, in this uh, photograph, you see Minister Kamp. And Oettinger is the, the High Commissioner of the European Union visiting the Quantum Technology Laboratory in, in Delft. And uh, this EU flagship is a Dutch initiative and it will be formally or officially launched in just a month, 17 May, in Amsterdam, when all the, the big shots of the EU will be there and then that will be the, the, the launch of this, uh, of this flagship. And, and you know, it's, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that, that, it's, that it's now, and, and I want to somehow look ahead and, and see what this could mean for us as, as scientists here in Leiden, and how we could, how this could motivate our research for the coming decades, well, certainly motivate my research for the coming decades. So this is a timeline starting from, from this year or last year and looking ahead for 10 or 20 years what quantum technologies could offer us in this century. And some of the things are very familiar, atomic clocks, quantum sensors, it says intercity quantum link. The first intercity quantum link which is being planned at this moment will be between Delft, Leiden and Amsterdam. So a, a secure quantum link using secure quantum cryptography. And then a bit further ahead in the future, inventions which may change the world in a much more powerful way than just having secure communications, quantum simulators, universal quantum computer. Somehow I have a dream that, that um, you know, will be looking back perhaps 20 or 30 years from now, some of us will be looking back 20 or 30 years from now, and we'll look back and say, remember the time where there was no quantum computer? When if you had some rare disease, uh, you know, just by trial and error, you would have to find this one enzyme which makes this, which solves this, this deficiency, and now we just calculate it. And so there's this whole list of illnesses, this whole list of diseases, which are probably curable as a matter of principle, but we have to find the right, the right medicine. Thomas, where's Thomas? Thomas, where are you? Where's Thomas? Thomas tries to find uh, cures for diseases, rare diseases. So he has like recipes, very long recipes, which last three months. 
And then at the end, it will work, or typically it does not work. And then he starts again with another recipe, and he's been doing that now for four years. And then he will get a PhD. <laughs> and I'm and, uh, not sure that he has yet found a cure, but then there will be another PhD student. And if you, are, then you understand why these medicines for rare diseases, Sikta from Pompe, Sikta from Fraya, why these medicines cost 10,000 euros a year. Because, tr because of trial and error. And I have this vision that in the not so distant future, there'll be a whole list of diseases where we just calculate, calculate the cure. And we'll look back and say, imagine when, when we didn't have a quantum computer. Just as now we look back on the time when, when we didn't have antibiotics, we didn't have... Of course, this is somewhat a vision, but that's, that's the vision at least which is being sold to our policymakers, to Minister Kamp and Oettinger. That's what we're telling them. And that's why we're asking for one billion. Now, this is very much 21st century technology. But what's you know, interesting is that its roots go back almost a full century. The, the workhorse of quantum technology is this concept which is called entanglement, quantum entanglement, which goes back to 1935. It was discovered, if you wish, noted by Albert Einstein, who thought this is such a weird thing, quantum entanglement, this shows that quantum mechanics cannot possibly be correct. He called it spooky action at a distance, some weird thing. Entanglement is some sort of bond between, bond between distant objects, a bond which is unmeasurable. Imagine that I will tell you that, that you know, there's this thing which we call the human soul. It's there. It's what distinguishes, for, distinguishes, for example, people from animals, the human soul. But there's no way you can possibly measure it. It's completely, it doesn't emit radiation. You cannot weigh it. There's no way whatsoever in which you can measure it. Then you would say, OK, the human soul may or may not exist. But it's not in the domain of science. It's in the domain of it's certainly not in the domain of science. So now I tell you that there's this object here which has, a dis which has a bond with some distant objects, perhaps in some other planet, but there's no way you can possibly measure this bond. Just mathematically, the, the physical theory forbids you from measuring this bond. Then you would say, well, the bond is not there. And, and this, is what I, this is what Einstein objected to, this entanglement. And so what happened is, since 1935, philosophers thought about this. What can you do with this, this strange bond which you cannot measure, but which somehow still has, has consequences? And, and uh, they wrote books like, uh, you know, the, yeah, the God effects, not for nothing, because you know, you're, you're very much going into this area of the soul and, and, and strange things. Strange, not, science is the strangest phenomenon. So entanglement was very much an issue which was debated by people interested in, in foundations of physics, uh, philosophy of physics. It was something very weird. Some of us even tried to remove it from the theory. Uh, Geert het Hoofd is, is still his, his major preoccupation to remove entanglement as this strange, unmeasurable bond. And something has changed. Something has changed just in the last 10 years. And what has changed, the best way to somehow formulate this, is that now we have found a way to use entanglement to make money. Now, I'm not mentioning this as a, because I would be particularly interested to make money, but I think if you can have a company which makes money out of entanglement, then it's no longer in the realm of philosophy or... or you know, theories which are interesting, foundational theories, but which somehow do not interest society as a whole. And we have found that entanglement is not just some weird thing which is in this theory of quantum physics, but that this bond, this magic bond, this mysterious bond, can be used to do all kinds of things, to calculate, to communicate. It's become a resource. This is the concept of, of the 21st century, entanglement as a resource. A resource is this English word which means it's something which is like, like gasoline. It's something which you use. It's, it's perhaps expensive, but you use it, and then it's gone, and you have to renew it. And so entanglement is something which you can use. You can do things with it. Then it's gone. You have to renew it. But it's something precious 
which you can a driver for industry and this quantum manifesto is not about using quantum mechanics we've been using quantum mechanics for a century lasers transistors they all use quantum mechanics as a description of atoms and molecules entanglement plays no role in the laser in this computer and the quantum manifesto is about using in the 21st century using entanglement as a resource to solve to solve problems and I'm not so much into technology and, and my friends in Delft uh, they're very much into technology I see entanglement not so much as, as something as an enabler of technology but also as a unifying theme in physics in science actually not just in physics and this was recognized also by this this study report by the DOE that's the Department of Energy in the United States they had their own national Hobbes agenda and, and it's actually interesting to read this document and compare it with our own national Vetus Hobbes agenda. So they, they invited the, the, the experts in the field to, to identify the grand challenges in various fields of science, which where entanglement would, would be the, the key concept that would resolve these issues. And there's the issue of high temperature superconductivity and perhaps, actually I think that Jan Zane will, will address entanglement in his lecture in one of the parallel sessions very much a physics a physics problem there is uh, astronomy and astrophysics black hole some of you may know that there's this big paradox in black hole which is called the information paradox black hole which absorbs information and, and somehow the information is lost and entanglement may hold the key also there the information is not lost because of the mysterious bond between things which fall into the black hole and things which leave be, remain behind. So that's astronomy, astrophysics. The third one is, is, is kind of speculative, but if, if this turns out to be the case, it will, it will do something which actually I, I've been, I would enjoy very much to see. It would force our medical doctors to learn quantum mechanics. <laughs> Wouldn't this be amazing? You know, many of us, I have a son who works in the hospital, and, and he's useful to a certain sense. He knows, you know, he can solve differential equations, and, and, and he's, so he's kind of like useful, but, but imagine that to understand cognition, we would need to learn about entanglement. That would change everything. Now, this is not as far-fetched as it seems, because there is a molecule. I'm not into, into, into the biological chemistry, but the molecule is called the Poster complex, which has very long-lived entangled spins. And, and it might just be that this actually does play a role in, in, in cognitive processes. And I'm pretty sure that, that there, I mean, it would even be fun if one of you would try to do research. I mean, quantum cognition, if this takes off as a field, this will be a major game changer. So that's perhaps a bit speculative, but that's medicine, bio biology. Um, mach uh, quantum informatics, machine learning, algorithms, quantum algorithms. I'm very busy at this moment to try and, and, and get a, a Zwartekracht project off the ground, which would involve the, the, the quantum informatics department here and QSoft in Amsterdam, which is the center for quantum informatics. And then there's quantum chemistry, and quantum chemistry is this probably the, the, what they call the low-lying fruit. These will be the applications of the quantum computer which will first have economic value. And actually I've been told that the very first application which is being pursued now at this moment is to optimize um, the, the, the fertilizer. The, 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 the chemical cycle to produce fertilizer is not optimized sufficiently. And even a few percent increments there could have a major economic markets. And in fact, Minister Kampf, before launching this quantum manifesto, so he was, you know, he was told that qubits and, and that all of this would change, but he wanted some independent, independent, um, you know, assessment. And probably if, if this would be done by uh, NWO or, or OCNA, they would have a panel of professors. But Minister Kampf asked McKinsey, 
as McKinsey to assess the, the, the potential for, the, for quantum technology as a game changer. So how big is the market? And, and in particular, the quantum chemistry applications were seen as something which, in the near future, perhaps even 10 years from now, could, could have a, a big impact economically. So I see here a whole range of, of themes, uh, you know, covering pretty much everything we do here in this, in this faculty. And, and I have a good hope that, that, this will be a, that this will be something which will unify us. And I remember somehow the, the, okay, there were silly things like having to cover all our electrical appliances with stickers, Jag uh, 2000 proof. Some of our equipment, our copy machine still has this sticker. And, 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 uh, but there was also a general feeling of, of malaise that, you know, the 20th, certainly among physicists, the 20th century, that was the heroic age. And we've pretty much done everything. And there were people saying, you know, if you have a son who, or a daughter who's into science, advise them, don't advise them to go into physics. It's, it's, it's over. Of course, we've seen that. This was also what happened in 1900. And the year 2000 was just like that. And things have changed a lot now. No one will say that now. And I'm pretty sure that, I mean, I'm, I have this great hope that we'll look back 50 years from now and see how, how entanglement, how quantum technology changed the 21st century. And perhaps this is also something which we'll be celebrating 100 years from now when we have our third centennial. Thank you.